what bridges, you know, basically we are, we're trying to build there in a sense. And um, first off, I was, I'm gonna start off with um, passing a mic to the folks and basically introduction, introduce yourselves and what organization you're with and we just pass the mic on. Uh, power to the people, my name is Nadir Shakur, Chief of Staff for the Black Rights Liberation Party, New Generation Black Panthers. A second power to the people. Uh, my name is Ashanti Austin. I'm from uh, uh, New York, New Jersey. Uh, former member of the Black Panther Party, also a soldier, former soldier in the Black Liberation Army, former political prisoner, all of that stuff there. Right now, national co-chair of the Jericho Amnesty Movement. A third power to the people. I'm Dina Kamati. I'm a program member at KPFK as well as uh, I'm a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party from 72 on. Before that, I was in the Black Liberation Movement, Black Panther Party. Uh, my name is Roland Freeman. I'm uh, representing my brother, uh, Elder Freeman. Uh, he had a little surgery and he couldn't be here today, so I'm stepping in for his place. Uh, we are some original members of the Black Panther Party down here in Southern California. Uh, Black Panther Party, so, and um, I'm to talk to you about anarchism. All right, and now I'm gonna give the mic to Bilal Ali to speak about a sister who just recently passed away, Sister Samaya, who was also a revolutionary and member of the Black Panther Parties who was, until her death, was putting in work in her community. So I'm gonna give the mic to Bilal so he can show the sister respect. Um, Thank you. I'm Bilal Lee. I'm with Jerry Cole, Amnesty, Los Angeles, and the Nat Turner Guerrilla Cadre. I uh, want to start off before we begin this panel with a little honor for our sister, uh, Samaya Kambuti. Some people knew her as Sister Samaya. Some people knew her as back in the day uh, in the 60s, Peaches Moore, and some people knew her by other names. If you don't know who this woman is, I was listening to some of the uh, panels today and discussion around the uh, gender and feminism and such, and uh, made me think a lot about her. Well, uh, Samaya was a member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in the LA chapter. And many of you probably heard about the infamous shootout on 41st and Central between the Black Panther Party and the Los Angeles SWAT squad. That was the debut of a SWAT. They made their debut that day, and they got embarrassed. And they attacked at the Panther headquarters. There was a, some of the members of here, still living. There was a four-hour shootout. Samaya was the sister that was in there. She was in there with her comrades, and uh, she picked up that gun also, too. And they held off these uh, pigs for four hours. And... Uh, And basically, this was a great example for our community because it showed that self-defense was legitimate. It was also intelligent. And so, but she was the sister that was in there. She was down with her comrades. And I believe when there was a decision for people to come out of the office, and you got 600 police officers out there, and they're throwing everything in the Panther headquarters, and the Panthers are throwing it back at them. And... Um, decision for her to come out and she came out alone and uh, uh, basically said it's over so yes Wayne you tell this better than I do yeah well number one peaches did, didn't do any shooting you know she was in the shootout and she was in charge of communications. So she went up to the communication room and uh, contacted, you know, people such as yourself and uh, the news media and uh, our national headquarters and everything and let them know that we were under attack. Now I want you to picture this scene. After four hours, we had run out of bullets for most of the guns. We had run out of shotgun shells and 30 calibers, and that's what we mainly had. And uh, at that point, we had been shot out of positions. It was a two-story building. 
So, you know, the snipers had started to close in and get their range. So we were all piled up in one room. And the situation was so intense till Mr. Freeman, right there, who had been shot numerous times, asked for a pistol because he didn't want the police to run up on him unarmed. That was how intense it was, and that's what our mindset was, that we were going down for the count. And a tank was coming down the street. Uh, we knew that was coming. We could hear the police on the side of the building. So at that point, you know, the, uh, the conversation was, and it was a conversation. It wasn't just an arbitrary act, uh, was should we give up? And uh, then when that was decided, you know, who's going outside, you know? So <laughs> none of us wanted to go. And Peaches, uh, being the woman that she is, agreed to, uh, to go outside, and she went out. And, you know, we had a four-hour shootout. We didn't know what was going to happen. The remaining guns, we covered her as she went outside. And, uh, you know, had she been shot, we would have all died in there. So, you know, she saved our lives. It was a very courageous act. And make no mistake that she went outside, you know, in front of the police after a four-hour shootout. And you have to remember the times that were involved, you know. Uh, we were right there in the black liberation struggle right after 100 years of uh, reconstruction, right after desegregation and lynch law right after uh, uh, police brutality and everything else. So all that was in the mix. It wasn't like it is now. All that was in the mix. And for her to go out there, uh, she had more balls than all the rest of us. So all power to the people, power to peaches. Thank you, Wayne. Wayne, Wayne. OK, we're going to fast forward it up now. Later on down the line, a well, program, one of the programs that was instituted by the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles was the, around the issue of sickle cell anemia that was running rampant through our communities. And it wasn't being addressed through the uh, capitalist health care system. And uh, people took that responsibility, that initiative, and started educating the community about this disease, uh, some of its causes, and setting up free clinics. So that was set up. Fast forward some more. Uh, Sister Maya, she, she had sickle cell anemia, and, uh, which means excruciating pain. I sit up with her nights and nights helping her over this pain. And the only alternative, I mean, the alternative to the pain which they would give her would be morphine, which she didn't like. It only uh, addicted people, and it did not help anything. So she began to experiment with the hemp seed and hemp oil, and hemp. And she started developing uh, remedies where people weren't, didn't have to go and shoot the morphine and have to go through this pain. And she went to a conference with a lot of these folks that's behind the medicinal marijuana movement, and they laughed at her when she suggested that drinking hemp oil can ease the pain for sickle cell. And she was laughed out the room, and she was crying, she was going to quit, and she had a few comrades there, you know, soothing her. So that night, one of these folks that was at this conference went into, they call him an episode, and she went into this excruciating pain, and she just happened to have a bottle of the hemp oil that Sister Samaya gave her. She would always give this to people. And she consumed it, and it took the pain away. So that next day, Sister Samaya was the greatest thing since sliced, sliced white bread at that conference. You understand what I'm saying? So she carried that tradition. When I'm getting that, she carried that tradition from that Panther Party in dealing with that disease. And further on, she became a, uh, one of the major advocates in the state of California, helping pushing through the Compassionate Youth Act for medicinal marijuana. She helped pass that through, and at the same time, using this as a remedy for ailments. As subsequent of her efforts in trying to heal her community, she was a victim of raids. She would call them hater raids. And now this law in California says for medicinal purposes, you cannot be prosecuted for the possession or cultivating and giving that out as a remedy to people. But the LAPD had, you know, had other notions, so she was constantly being raided, having her plants confiscated. And she didn't give up. And when we did, we went to court, 
and she was exonerated just one time, and then we pushed to get the plants back. The LAPD had to get the plants back. This was private property, it was illegal. And we forced them to give us the plants back. But the plants were mildewed. So we said we wanted to have that replaced with, you know, quality that they took. And they says no. So anyway, we initiated a lawsuit that went on and on and on about that. But fast forwarding up again, she never gave up. She was always a soldier, very stubborn, a little small lady, maybe about a buck 15, but had a colossus heart and soul. And the, the brother was talking about the shootout. That was December 8, 1969. 39 years to that day, December 8, this past Monday, we sent Sister Maya on to her ancestors. So it's quite ironic that it's some, in some way it's come full circle. So this is the spirit that we came up in the black liberation movement. A lot of us still harbor, and we still strive for and we're going to continue to push for it. And that's basically where we're coming from. All right, um, so I want to ask, I guess, folks on the panel, what has been some of your personal experiences, not only in the Black Panther Party, but with anarchist organizers or organizations? Uh, ready for the revolution. Um, I, last anarchist convention I attended was a number of years ago in Santa Monica. And at that conference, there was a third world panel where uh, people of color broke off and flip up, set up a panel. I was asked to speak at that. In our discussion and dialogue, one of the things that became clear was that the black, brown, and Asian anarchists were following European anarchistic theoreticians. And my contribution as a Pan-Africanist, as an internationalist, was as critical for people of color within the anarchist movement to look at pre-colonial Africa, Asia, and Latin America, the pre-slavery periods of Africa and Asia and Latin America, because Africa did, in fact, have a period of slavery. It wasn't nothing similar to the European Western shadow slavery we know about, but there was class stratification of pre-contact Africa, but there was a long, rich, glorious period from the birth of humanity, which all human beings came from Mother Africa, from Northwest Ethiopia, Afro Afrikaners, and populated the world where communalism, a non-stratified, a lack of contradiction with Mother Earth with the land that dominated human civilization worldwide. So my challenge to the young people of color anarchists was to, of course, study Marx, Lenin, Bakunin, all the great anarchist theoreticians coming out of Europe and the United States. But most importantly, let's go to the roots of this notion of a non-hierarchical, a non-chauvinistic, a non-sexist, of a non-commodified society. Let's look and study what you want to call it, philosophical anthropology, ideological anthropology, and go to our roots and historical contribution of Africa and people of color to egalitarian society, because the mothership of egalitarianism came out of Africa. And it hurts me to see people of color following European anarchists as if that's the godfather of the notion of anarchism when in fact, we all have made a contribution. I'm not denying the contributions of contemporary European and white anarchist theoreticians to the development of anarchist theory, but it's also a root. It's kind of like when I was young, I always thought that Newton discovered and made the law of gravity. As I became developed critical thinking, I realized he just happened to be the European that wrote a theory, and because all the textbooks I ever studied was Europe, written by European textbooks, all of a sudden, news law of gravity, but Newton discovered the law of gravity. The first human being that had a consciousness through something up in the air came down, understood the law of gravity. You follow what I'm saying? Y'all dig what I'm saying? So I think it's very important for us as human beings to look at the contribution because sometimes in the left movement, there's racism. There's intellectual chauvinism. And we've got to combat that because we've all made a contribution. So in terms, and, and also I have to big up, have to big up what's going on in Greece today. I have to big that up. They have really shown the power of young people and students in alliance with the trade union movements, in alliance with different Marxists and different progressive forces to challenge state capitalism, state bureaucracy in Greece. And it's a role model because, as you well know, it's spreading throughout Europe. And objective economic, political, and ideological conditions are ripe in the United States. What we have to do is get out of our little sectarian bags. I look around. I don't see Africans here. I don't see black folks here. What's up? 
So I think it's important for us to kind of begin to acknowledge the historical contribution of all humanity, especially Africa and African people, because, because of the, what they call the mannequin light motif, that which is black, whether it's images, whether intellectual, whatever, whatever is considered negative. So we run away from our contribution to humanity. So that's all I got to say. The young man said, as uh, far as being a Black Panther Party, an anarchist, and so on and so forth. As I, when I introduced myself, I told you I was speaking from my brother's name. is Elder Freeman. He's in the Bay Area up in Oakland. Some of you guys have, may know him. But uh, he's, uh, he likes you guys a whole lot, a, a whole lot. And he speaks of you highly. And that's why I'm here to represent him. And in, in a certain terms, I guess I'm an anarchist because uh, I believe in, you know, like burning this motherfucker down. You know, uh, I, I really don't really give a fuck. Excuse my language, but I'm gonna just, you know, uh, he told me I was coming to an anarchist meeting, so I feel like I can speak my mind with you anarchists, you understand? So, uh, you know, when I joined the Black Panther Party, like I told you, me and my brother, we was uh, one of the, some of the original members that joined the Black Panther Party under Bunchy Carter. And uh, when we joined the party, when it was just a small nucleus, maybe 30, 40, 50 people, you know, our goal was to overthrow this motherfucker straight out. Uh, we was here to overthrow the government. Now, we had enough intelligence and enough sense to knew that we wasn't going to do it, but we was going to die and fight and do whatever we could to overthrow it because it's an evil system. This, 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 all of this is just bullshit, you know, and it's perpetuating itself, and it's perpetuating itself on the blood of everybody, all the people in the world. Everybody suffers, so we can just sit up here with microphones in our hands and sit in chairs and cement street is cement and all this stuff. So I mean, the, if you really believe either you are a federal agent or you really believe that this is some corrupt shit and it really needs to be destroyed, and that's basically my whole point of view. That I live my life that way. Uh, unfortunately, we do find ourselves, I'm 63 years old now. I dealt with a little cancer, got false hips and stuff. So there is a reality, even when you know what's wrong and you fight it, there's still a reality where you have to live in it and be a part of it, but that don't mean you have to accept it and, 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 get, and bow down to it. So don't never bow down to this bullshit. That's all I got to say. If, if the, the question is what um, the impact of anarchism had on us, I, then for me, it was studying uh, the f defeat of the Black Panther Party that led me to anarchism, you know, because I wanted to understand from a prison cell why we lost, you know, and I know that I had to read. And what better place to read if you're in that circumstances than in prison? But I had an opportunity to uh, have a lot of material and my comrades in prison with me had a lot of stuff to share with me and we had a lot of conversations. And around studying the, what went wrong with the Black Panther Party was for me, um, things like the leadership, that there was a top-down leadership, you know, that the decisions was being made by a small crew on the top. And there wasn't a lot of creativity or, or, or participa participation from the rank and file though the rank and file did the work. The rank and file created the successes of the Black Panther Party. So in prison, I mean, like, we're studying all this stuff, and I'm finding that uh, what interests me more was forms of struggle that was more what we call today horizontal, was more collective, that was more communal, you know? And I found a wealth of examples, you know? I mean, typical things that, you know, we talk about in the anarchist circles is always Spanish Civil War, uh, the, um, the group in Russia, um, Makhno, and all this other stuff. And I got tired of anarchists just talking about them, but I discovered that um, groups, early groups around the world and groups today are still functioning without being top down, that they was collectivists, that they did things in a circle, whether it's indigenous folks here or indigenous folks anywhere in the world. So I'm like, well, why can't we do that? Why do we have to rely on top-down leadership? Why do we have to have another situation where um, uh, Huey P. Newton, Algis Cleaver, Bobby Seale, and others are making decisions when people's creativity show every day that we can do the work, we can do the thinking, 
that we're not without brains, we're not without energy. So for me, it was looking for, when I got out of prison, looking for those organizations or those people who were operating in a more anarchist way. And did not find no black folks, not at all. Did not find no brown folks. Did not find no Asian folks. I found white folks. But like my struggle from the Panther Party is still dedicated to the liberation of black people first and foremost. So I want to get to know them. I want to get to know what, you know, anarchists do. But them things has got to be applied to my people, to my people. So then I discover Martin Sostry, black Puerto Rican. Then I discover Kwesi Balagoon from out of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. And then I discover um, uh, uh, Roberto Flores Magon and all these other folks of color who were anarchists, who was trying to do something so different to keep power to the people amongst the people. So for me, the whole, my whole journey is still, how do we manifest power to the people and keep it there? It didn't say power to the politicians, to the preachers, it said to the people. So for me, I study, I learn, I work with people, I observe. I go to Chiapas, I wanna see, well, how are the Zapatistas doing this? I wanna see, and I wanna be able to bring back lessons here, because when you look at what's happening to our people, they are wiping us out. We cannot afford to have structures where somebody is up top doing all the thinking, telling us what to do. I, I know I got a brain, I got creativity, I want mine to be just as relevant of whoever's up top thinking that they are the ones that can figure this out. So for me, that's where I am at. Every example of people fighting that shows that the people are the number one concern and power stays located amongst the people that is not shooting up, I'm like, well, we can do that. We can do that here. We don't have to make the same mistakes as others have in the past, whether it was the Panthers, the Young Lords, or the Native American movements. It doesn't matter, even the workers. And, and, and like my comrade says, the history of racism, white supremacy in this country makes it uh, so important that there be anarchisms that relate to our experience, whether the white anarchists like it or not. You know, whether we read one book of, of Kropotkin or whether we got a picture of Emma Goldman on the wall, Asada Shakur is just as good or even better, you know? So the whole thing for me, with even the conferences, there, there's been so much interest amongst folks of color and anarchism. And the whole thing about it is that we all want to be seen. We all want to be a part of the creative process of freeing ourselves. That's what it's all about. And every people will do it in their way. Every people will develop an indigenous form of anarchism, which just basically says power to the people, to the brown folks, to the workers, to the queer folks, whatever, that we all want to be free. That is the basis of what I work from now, and I won't turn from that. Right on. Um, missed the introduction, prostate took priority. Uh, my name is Michael D. McCarty. I was a member of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party uh, in Chicago. And looking out, some of you might notice I've been scanning the audience, and um, I'm recalling a conversation I had with someone years ago, and he asked me, what happened to the revolution? What happened to the revolutionaries? And one of the things that makes me feel real good, this is, um, there was another anarchist convention a little earlier, uh, yeah, and I was here for that also. It's good to see this mix of people, um, especially young people, all kinds of people. And we got the old folks up in here and young folks up in here with a consciousness that something is amiss in this world, in this society, and that we have to do something about it. And one of the things that everyone said so far 
is that it's important that we all, each as individuals, we work together when we can, but the thing about it, we have to be self-sustaining units. We have to, each of us, who has a vision of a better world, do what we can, when we can, to make that vision a reality. You work with whoever you can work with, regardless of race, creed, creed color, um, social status. But if everybody around you flakes, fine. You keep doing it. What you're talking about, when you talk about revelation, revolution and revelation, <laughs> you're not talking about the norm. I mean, most people don't go out of their way to start a revolution, to be part of a revolution. It's not what people normally do. Most people want to like, have a nice, easy way of life. And it's usually things that force us, thrust us into these situations. There was a quote, um, one of my favorite quotes from Mao, from the Little Red Book. Social practice is the criterion of truth. People can talk and say, but what's important is what do you do? On a day-to-day -day basis, what do you do? There are a lot of different ways to approach all, we got enough problems in society, in this society, in the world, that every approach is valid and needs to be dealt with at every different level. You find the level that you can get in on. And the bottom line is that social practice is the criterion of truth. Do something. God, what was that quote? Um, no, 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 this is much, this is much, do something, uh, do something if you only spit. But do something. And that's the end of that. Um, well, my most recent experience with the anarchists is I went to jail <laughs> with the anarchists. And um, that shit ain't funny. On some serious, I'm about to put y'all up on the reality of the revolution. Now, like I said in the beginning, I'm a black rider. I carry on the legacy and the death toll of the Black Panther Party. I signed on when I became a black rider. I said I'm going to die for the people because I love the people. I'm going to go to jail for the people because I love the people. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to manufacture the conditions to destroy capitalism on a world scale. Now, now, what I want to say is I want people to understand that everybody here, you say you're an anarchist or you're a revolutionary, now we're here to build solidarity. But you cannot build solidarity on stupidity. You cannot build solidarity on individualism. Now, we as the Black Riders, we want to work with any organization and any individual that wants to end capitalism, end fascism, and wants to raise the people up, like my comrade said, and put the power back into the hands of the people. But you have to be smart. You have to analyze. This isn't a Ronald Reagan or a J. Edgar Hoover that we're dealing with. That's old school. We're dealing with some shit that's been mastermind. We're dealing with some shit that's coming from all angles. And if we don't pay attention to what we're doing right now, we will make the same mistakes that we did in, back in the day. We will be destroyed. And we don't have time for that shit. You know, this world is ending on a mass scale. And if you don't believe that, then you might want to leave. Because that's what we're here for. We're here to pull people out of the mud and who's really going to do the work. And I feel as though that if we're going to build a coalition that we have to work together and that we have to listen to each other's ideas and we have to work in unison, one individual can't do a move and not analyze how that is going to reflect on everybody else. That means you're not using your ideology into practice. What does Marxism teach you? It teaches us about dialectical materialism, cause and effect. If you make one stupid move, it's going to be an effect that's going to, you know, it's going to weigh through everybody else. So I just wanted to make that point.
that that's been my most recent experience with anarchy is not paying attention, not calculating fascism and how they're going to deal with you and when to pick your battle. See, that's a panther. A panther picks their battles. We just don't run out in the street and shoot because we feel like if they did, there was a provocateur. We didn't have nothing to do with that. But we pick our battles. We guerrillas. I feel as though that the relationship between anarchy and Black Panthers is that there has to be ideology and there has to be a functioning ideology like Dedon said that fits our culture. We, not con we can't continue to uh, be dogmatic and do the same steps that Marx put down. We can't do the, the same things that Trotsky put down. That was in their era and that was in their economic system. We have to apply a whole new strategy. And if you understand colonialism, then you understand that the biggest neo-colony in the mother country of America is the African race, the African nation. And that means we have to put our work in to uplift our nation. We have to build a revolutionary vanguard that is going to manufacture the conditions to uproot the people and put the power and the weapon back into the hands of the people. But if we're going to work in coalition with any group, with any anarchist, then they have to follow the ideology of that vanguard. You have to follow because you don't have calculation. You don't have a critical analysis. We organize game bangers as the Black Riders because we understand that they are one of the greatest anarchists. They are the epitome of anti-authoritarianism. That's why we organize game bangers. But who are you going to organize to manufacture the conditions that we need to rise ourselves up, up out of this bullshit that we live in? That's what we should be here about today. And it's not going to take just one night. We're not saying that. But what we are saying is that we recognize what we're going to do. They recognize the work that they've already done. But what we're saying is if you call yourself an anarchist, if you call yourself an anti-authoritarian, if you want to be egalitarian, then you have to find an ideology that fits your cultural background. And if you are an anarchist of color, then that means you need to follow up under communalism because that's where, you, that's where you derive from. That's your indigenous ideology. You do not need to base your soul spiritual guidance on a European dictate that is foreign to you. Like my brother Didon said, I love that he made that point because that's one of our biggest contradictions with anarchism is that it doesn't fit our personal cultural needs as African people and African people abroad. We have to find ourselves. And that's it. Some very powerful statements. I'm almost in awe of these people up here. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with what the sister said, Brother Dedine and Brother Roland. And, you know, my thing is, you know, having been in armed struggle, uh, I, I, you know, I just listen to a lot of people now, you know, the bullshit. You know, uh, the first thing you know, anarchism. You know, I have a picture of uh, somebody running down the street with a Molotov cocktail, throwing it, busting windows, and a whole bunch of bullshit. The reality of armed struggle is death. You know, if you're gonna go up against the power structure, that's the reality. You know, they got tanks, they got planes, they got bombs, they got bombs that will kill you and leave the building standing. So, you know, uh, uh, I'm very against bullshit. I'm very against the unnecessary loss of life. And I'm very against posturing, you know. And what I mean by posturing is people walking around thinking they're tough and going for bad and I can do this and I can do that and I can do the other. All we all going to do is die eventually one day. So... As Roland said, he's 63, I'm 58 now, and uh, I'm in the life. I'm not in the death, you know, and, and I don't want to see myself die, and I definitely don't want to see young people die unnecessarily. You know, I, you should, your life is, is, is all that you really have. You know, you come in the world by yourself, you're going to leave here by yourself. And you're not taking nothing with you. There's no U-Haul trucks at the funeral home. You're not taking none of that shit with you. You're not taking no checking accounts, no money, no cocaine, 
no whiskey. None of that's going with you. None of that. You know, you're going by yourself. I've been to too many funerals. So as the sister said, and uh, Brother Dedan, it's your ideology. And, and one must develop an ideology and then struggle is lifelong. You know, you struggle. Uh, we struggled when we were 19 and 20 years old and in our own way, we're still struggling. And my struggle now is I try to preach to the youth about what I just told you. You know, that false posturing that's being played by the system. You know, black people get played by the system. You know, if I was from a foreign country and I looked at videos, you know, I'd had to get me a black woman. I'd had to get one where they're shaking their ass on the videos. I would think that would represent all black women. If I looked at the movies, I would think that black people, black men were the baddest MFs in the world. It could nobody whoop no black man that, that, you know, that he just pull a gun out. You know, like, wait a minute, let me digress a second. There was a little crazy show on TV once called Spencer for Hire. Some of you might remember that. And they had a black guy in the show that ran around Boston with a 357 Magnum, right? And he'd pull his Magnum out and pistol whip people and he'd do all kind of crazy shit. Now that was so unreal. That was so unreal. But now, you know, you have our youth that get caught up in the stigma and, and, and try to live this image. You got people that's going for bad. You got white guys. You know, some of you guys look at wrestling and you see junkyard uh, somebody out there and you know, you think this is the real world. This is not it. You got Spanish boys that look at, at, at the TV and everybody's a cholo. Everybody's got a knife. Everybody cut your throat. You know, they're cold-blooded killers. That's not the reality. That is not the reality. And that's what the system puts on the mind of the people to keep us divided. You know, uh, the system doesn't portray this meeting, uh, this group of men here. The system portrays a false image that, that you look at, and weak-minded people believe this is true. They believe this is how it is, and this is what it is, and I'm a bad MF, and I'm going to beat everybody in this room's ass. You know, I had a guy tell me once we were business partners, and he told me, he said, uh, when I went to Fremont, this is a high school here in L.A., he said, when I went to Fremont, I could whoop everybody at Fremont. And my thought process said, why are you telling me this? <laughs> you know, should I go arm myself? Because I can't whoop everybody at Fremont now. And then beyond that, it shows me if you had to fight everybody at Fremont to figure out you could whoop all of them, then you have no negotiation skills. <laughs> you know? I don't need to be with you anyway, you know, because I talk myself out of most ass whoopings, you know, just start running my mouth, you know what I mean? So this is where we have to be real. You have to look at the reality of the situation. As this sister said, uh, all of us are different cultures. The same power to the people is power to the people. Black power for black people, white power for white people, uh, Chicano power for Chicano people, red power for Asian people. Everybody needs their power. I don't have a problem with that. You know, then once we recognize our power base, we work together as a people. You know, so uh, again, you know, the anarchy is good, but you have to have an ideology, you have to have a program, and you have to be pro-people. So my, my next question is, can each one of you give us a positive reflection on the Black Panther Party as well as a critical reflection on the Black Panther Party? Original, as well as now, you know, because the New Age Black Panther Parties and what you guys are going through, give us some, if you can also give us some positive experiences as well as negative. Well, I, the Black Panther Party was very positive. You know, somebody asked me once, what rank were you in the Black Panthers? I was just so proud to be a member of the Black Panther Party till, you know, I never aspired to be a, a, a general 
uh, we called them generals, you know, and, and we used to say uh, all the generals were at home sleeping and the paper boys were shooting their ass off. You know what I mean? But uh, the experience was power. And what you have to look at, that the Black Panther Party was the culmination of 100 years of Reconstruction. Uh, Mr. Freeman is, a, is an expert on the Civil War. And during the Civil War, you know, black people fought in the army, but we never had our cleansing when the black troops moved in at Appomattox to, to uh, defeat the Southern forces under Robert E. Lee. Grant allowed Lee to surrender. So in our black history, we never had that cleansing. And then right after the Civil War, you know, this guy, what's his name, Bedford Ford started the Klan and uh, the Night Riders and all that, and, and, and the whole black movement was, dis, you know, was uh, dissipated. So the Black Panther Party came up out of the uh, Civil Rights era, out of the 50s, out of the 60s. You'd have to say all the way, all the way back to the Civil War. We were that legacy. You know, uh, 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 in my life, I could feel lynching. I could actually feel it. You know, uh, you know, growing up in the South, in Port Arthur, Texas, you know, I saw the, 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 the black, you know, like they had the restrooms, white only and black only and, and, and black men and women and this type of thing. And, you know, when I went to Texas, my grandmother had to tell me how to act and I did some things that, were, that, that you know, that I wasn't supposed to be doing, like I'm Moon, the, the milkman. I didn't know the white milkman was, was delivering milk and I'm Moon, the milkman. And, we was on the train going to the south, and I was running across the train, and the conductor hit me over the head. And I, at that time, I thought my grandmother was the, the biggest person in the world. And when that guy hit me over the head, and I went back to my grandmother, and I saw her bow down to this white guy. I mean, bow down to this white guy that busted me. My eye was busting to still slant it. You know, that hurt me. That hurt me. That's what made me join the Black Panther Party. You know, because I wasn't going to allow that to happen no more. You know, so the, the party was positive. It needed to be done at that time. That we had a right to defend ourselves. That needed to be said and that needed to be died for. You know, we had to die for that. We're going to defend ourselves. This is our office. This is our house. You're not coming in here. That's the end of that. If you don't have a say, and you have the same right. It's not just a black right, that's an American right. That you have the right to defend yourself against any act of aggression. Now, once you start attacking somebody, the shoe goes on another foot. <laughs> you understand? They have a right to defend themselves against you. But as a people, and we cannot really, de I don't believe in nonviolence, turn the other cheek. You know, that shit is dead. You know, I don't believe in that. I believe that you have a right to defend yourself from the gangbangers, from the mafia, from the police. I don't respect no gangsterism on any level. I don't respect gangsterism. I, I respect people. And so, yes, the Black Panther Party was very positive. I don't want to go too far. Um, well, whew, so many things you can say about the Black Panther Party. I was first introduced to the original Vanguard when I was seven years old through a documentary, and then I went to school for about a week in all black screaming power to the people, and I got expelled, you know. So uh, I've always, always admired the Black Panther Party. And one of the most special things that brought me to the ideology is that they went to the most disenfranchised members of society. They organized the lumber proletariat, which is the unemployed, the underemployed, and the unemployable. And that's where I come from, all of the above. And that's the most inspiring thing about the Black Panther Party is that, yeah, they organized on campuses and they organized anywhere because they're professional revolutionaries. But the rank and file was people that were just been in the mud yesterday. 
were just illiterate yesterday, were just on crack yesterday, were just selling their vaginas yesterday, and then the next day they're politicized, they're reading the red book, they know the communal, uh, the programs, they know how to uh, spit the 10 point platform with so much passion verbatim that they could actually, you know, instill consciousness into their other brother that they were just smoking with or their other sister that they were just walking the track with. That's one of the most inspiring things about the Black Panther Party to me as a youth is because I come from gang banging. I come from a family of drugs, prostitution, and just so much slavery and so much decadence that only an uh, organization as audacity as the Black Panther Party, only an organization that has so much character, so much charisma, and so much, excuse my language, not give a fuck-ism, if that is a word, like the Black Panther Party is something that I could join because that's the type of community that I come from. Now, I can't really make too many criticisms on the party because I wasn't there. I can only criticize what I'm doing. But what I can give is an analysis that I have of the original guard is a reason why you have some of the members that have different personalities today. And that's because even though they organized the membership from the mud and they gave them a political system to follow and they gave them a paramilitary code of honor, they didn't really instill in them culture. And so you have a lot of Black Panthers that they come from the lumpen, the lumpen proletarian class, but they carried on their lumpen characteristics into the party. And so you had a lot of issues with people not really becoming totally as African as they should have. And you had a lot of Panther factions that had a lot of culture more than others. So you'll go to one chapter and they still had their slave names. And then you'll go to another chapter and they had, uh, had African names. And these comrades couldn't pronounce these comrades names. And these comrades that thought those comrades were corny and goofy because they had African names. And I just feel as though maybe that that if our comrades would have really insisted that people learn their culture because culture gives you that spiritual discipline to carry on the revolution. I wouldn't be a revolutionary today with all the times I've been in jail, all the times I got my ass whipped by the police doing this black rider shit. I wouldn't still be a revolutionary if I didn't believe in God, if I didn't have Allah on my side every single day telling me that oppression is worse than slaughter, that what I'm doing is God-givenly and right. I wouldn't continue to do this. And I feel as though that maybe if my comrades back in the day had more culture, had more spirituality, had a, a destiny that would to put them more connected with our motherland that they have now, like all the comrades now, they understand that. But back then, they didn't have that so much understanding, and then maybe I feel as though that that would have kept them from the crack. That would have kept them from doing some of the things that Jay Gay, Edgar Hoover, and the rest of those clowns brought into the party with the provocateurs to break down the discipline. And that's about it. Fred Hampton. Next year will be the 40th anniversary of his assassination. And one of the things that was remarkable about Fred Hampton was that there are people who are leaders who um, are great leaders, but they don't inspire and stimulate growth within the people who are following them. Fred Hampton was one of those people who motivated and instilled. Fred Hampton could come up here and say to everybody in this room, y'all can walk through that wall and we'd all be walking right through that sucker. He was that kind of individual. And he didn't have a big ego about it. It wasn't about him, it was about the revolution. I was sitting here uh, listening, I, I was in, uh, listening to several people who gave quotes from Fred. Cause he was just, he was dynamic, he was positive. He was someone who taught me the meaning of commitment because his commitment was absolute and total. And it was the kind of commitment that make, made you want to have that. And people, that doesn't come along often, all right? And he was snuffed out at 21 because, because he had that, because that is dangerous. 
that is absolutely dangerous. That kind of will to inspire and to motivate, that's dangerous stuff. If you got it, watch out, but get it out. The thing, um, the negative, there were factions, you were just talking about it a little bit, but there were factions that developed within the party, divide and conquer, old school uh, technique. And it's a reality. We have different people have different personalities. I, I'm sure that there are people here that you you know some people who couldn't be in the same room if you weren't there because of different personalities. But sometimes that becomes such that it keeps you from working together and it and it it, it, it divides you. And it hurts me that to this day that some of those antagonisms still persist. But that's human nature. But um, Fred Hampton, if you don't know about Fred, find out. If you haven't read any of his speeches, they're, they're on the internet. They're the Cedar Murder of Fred Hampton. Um, uh, the Black Panther Speaks has uh, uh, at least one of his speeches in there. Fred. Um, there's, there's a lot that can be said. I, in some ways, I feel like I would be responding to, to my comrades, um, and I think some part I am. Um, in the Panther Party, we said unity, struggle, unity. You start off with unity, you struggle. You got different ideas, different opinions, till you come out with a new unity. So it's all right to have differences of opinion, okay? So one of the things I, I want to say in terms of why the Panther Party, what was positive for me was that it was like for the first time that I know was a group of young folks who was willing to take the lead position on stage of our history and say, we gonna do this by any means necessary and really mean it. Young folks who was not afraid to get up in our oppressor's face and say, that's it. Power to the people mean we coming at you and we don't, we're not afraid to die. Black Panther Party, we took risks. Young folks took risks. But we, we developed some things that I think was definitely an error. Like when we talk about ideology, as an anarchist, I'm not about ideology. But ideology don't mean I'm not about analysis. It doesn't mean that anarchists are not about thinking about things or developing programs. Many of us see ideology as what some people develop that has all the answers. The ideology of the Black Panther Party was the 400 year experience of black people through the lens of Marxism, Leninism, European. And I ain't saying that Huey and Bobby ain't have, uh, uh, didn't use a different take on it, but still very much. And then came Maoism, and then came Kim Il-sung, right? For me, that was some of the th things that went wrong. For me, for them to be the ones up top doing that, and we had to follow it on the bottom, that democratic centralism thing, meant that we had to be pretty much like the pawns to the leadership. Didn't mean that Huey wasn't great. Whether he was a genius or not, I don't know. But for someone who was not that educated that could take revolutionary ideas and figure out a way to make them relevant to people in the community, it was a great thing. For me, the lesson of the Black Panther Party is that you know that ideas gotta go into the community, that they can't stay intellectual. And when we even see the movie Panther, when they started that cop watch and they, was, they, they intervened, got out the car and intervened on them police, the people that came out the club, and, and this is just the scene from the movie, they saw people putting ideas into practice, not ideology, ideas into practice. The key is Panther Party was about putting things into practice. Practice is the criterion of truth. We study that stuff so, stuff so much. I think many of us still know it today. We just need a little edge, a little nudge, right? But still, and confronting the counterintelligence program and all them local police stations, special squads, the pressure was on. I think we did the best we could in trying to maintain the survival programs and, time, and trying to protect our communities. 
but the FBI also saw the weaknesses of the leadership. They could play off, they analyzed them personalities. They knew that they could send a poison letter to one and say, yo, Eldridge, watch out, Huey is trying to get you, Huey. Eldridge wants your position, right? And people just fall into line. What you need to know is the lesson of that. The lesson, what happens when you have certain kinds of leadership that falls prey to those kinds of things? I say that they have less chance of happening when you have collective leadership, like if we was right here in this room and we're facing each other, we're consensing, we're putting our ideas and arguments on the table. We're participating rather than maybe us up here going upstairs there, coming out with a program and just telling you this is the way it goes. Panther Party did great things, but when you become an authoritarian leadership and you're treating your members the same way that the capitalist oppressors treat us, there's something wrong. When your vision of socialism is not too much different from that capitalism that you're just saying that was going to be communal, and when you see that these so-called socialist revolutions, ain't none of them won, ain't none of them put power to the people and to play, you got to be critical. You got to be critical. For me, for me, even though there was a hierarchy in the Panther Party on the ground in the programs, we worked together. Study groups, each one teach one, taking that red book and passing it around the group. You take a paragraph, you read it, break it down. If you need some help, someone else in that room around that circle is probably going to be able to help you. We were learning to put them programs into practice. Everybody had to come in. Get your behind up, 6 in the morning. Do the work. The experience is collective, regardless of that contradictory top-down leadership. So what I look at is what did we do that was good, and how can we build on that? There doesn't even for that necessarily have to be another Black Panther Party or even another Black Panther Party type group. There needs to be organizing that takes them lessons on whatever you name your group, because it ain't in the name. Black Panther is just the name. It was the people that was the magic of the Black Panther Party. We got to look at what caused us to lose, to participate in our own destruction. For me, if you got an ideology that has all the answers, you got a problem right there. Can't nobody else tell you anything? Which happened with the Black Panther Party. The People's Revolutionary Convention in 1970, great opportunity, almost like a Zapatista encuentro. But the Black Panther Party said, no, we got this. We're leading this. You got all these other groups here that are saying the women, the, the Puerto Ricans, the, in, in, uh, the Native Americans saying, we got a program, but the Black Panther Party still wants to be in charge. You can't have that. Don't shut down no other group's uh, uh, creativity, their self-determination. So the criticism, the critical part for me is what led us to self-destruct? What caused us to lose the respect of the people? We know what the oppressor is going to do. We know how the media is going to paint us. Criminals, murderers, killers from the hood, all that stuff, fine. But we had a brief period with them programs where people even began to respect the lumping in the neighborhood, you know? I mean, Bobby Steele and some others now want to give the impression that we wasn't from the hood, that we wasn't street from the streets, that we was just workers or we, worked, we were mechanics. Some of us was, some of us wasn't. I was a burglar. That's what I did. But then began to put some of that into the Panther. <laughs> But, it, but so what I'm saying, <laughs> well, what I'm saying is the idea is how to keep power in people's hands. And I'm saying ideology for me means that you've already got in your mind that you got all the answers, that we got to now follow you. Vanguard, what does it mean that a group will come and say, you got to follow me? The Zapatistas say, no, we don't want to take power. Let's create a space and bring people into the space because other people got some thinkings on this. That means you respect other people too. More head, one, one head, hey, more heads is better than one. For me, that's the challenge, not to recreate something that was at one time very revolutionary. What must we do now to win? 
in real concrete ways to win. I have all respect for um, for the black riders in the new in the new Black Panther Party too, though I have differences. But they on the oh, front yeah, lines. Yeah, no, I'm just saying because I know them too. <laughs> but they on the front lines. And in New York, I, I got a lot of respect for the new Black Panther Party because when the police rolled on us one day, they was there and they let me throw down with them. And I was fine with that because they didn't run and they, in their minds, they know they're warriors. So in my anarchism, even a group that I disagree with in some ways in ideology, but I don't disagree because they're about our liberation, they are about our people. They're about our people, more so than I got to deal with a lot of white anarchists who got a problem with my nationalism. You know, I'm about my people, number one, foremost. I don't trust no one else to be our allies unless you prove it. You prove it. But the Black Panther Party did even around solidarity. They set some great examples. But we're not perfect. But I'm to this day proud, proud to say that I was a Panther. And at one point, even a soldier in the Black Liberation Army, proud of to this day, and never say, I'm not going to pick up a gun again. Never say, I ain't going back on the ground because my people ain't free. And madmen, psychopaths are still in power. So what are we going to do? Yeah. <laughs> on my way over here, I got a phone call from a buddy of mine who had just received a DVD, and it's called like 586 Attempts on the Cuban Revolution on Fidel Castro. And I actually want to get a copy and I'll make it available to you. But what blows my mind is that Cuba, a little tiny rock, little island off the coast of Florida, you can actually stand in Key West, Florida and see Cuba. That's how close it is to the greatest, largest, meanest, imperialist power in the world has sustained you know, 12 U.S. presidents, every U.S. president have committed themselves, especially to their Florida block, but committed themselves to smashing this communist country off the coast of Florida. And they have failed. FBI, CIA, over 186 U.S. intelligence agencies, together with the British and Israeli and the French, we can go every capitalist and purist country in the world has attempted to overthrow the Cuban Revolution and have failed. So for me, the demise of the Black Panther Party was not because of the FBI or CIA. If the FBI and CIA was that strong, there would not have been a Vietnamese revolution, a North Korean revolution, a Cuban revolution, the liberation of you know, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, the Congo. They, they would not have occurred. The critical question for me, and this is, I'm going to start with the negative and the positive, is a question, and he might not like the word ideology, but I don't use ideology in a Marxist, Leninist sort of way, nor do I deal with political parties in a vanguard party sort of way. Many of us have studied the revolutions in Guinea, for instance, in Ghana, and talk about mass party, everybody automatically is a member of the party. In fact, if you study Cuba carefully, the Cuban Communist Party does not run Cuba. They have a mass democratic process. And August, a cat named August, and I have the DVD and I played it on the radio, I'll do it again, talks about the mass character of the Cuban Revolution. Because if Cuba was an elite society, okay, an elitist run by Cuban Communist Party, which only four or five percent of the members of the party, the CIA and all these intelligence agencies would have successfully have overthrown the Cuban Revolution. Because everything from the voice of uh, uh, Marti to literally billions of dollars being funneled in to finance counter-revolution, chemical warfare, swine food, poison cigars. They even had some shaving cream. They tried to get Rafido's beard. They put the shaving cream on. I mean, the, uh, 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 the cream on his face, his beard would fall off because the US CIA thought that without the beard, he would lose his charisma and people would hate Fidel Castro. That's how stupid they are. So, I mean, it's really ridiculous. So for me, the central question is ideological. My problem with the Black Panther Party, I joined a party in San Diego as a young college kid because of revolutionary black naturalism. That's why I joined. I honestly believe that whether it's Bob Brown in Chicago, we can go across the country, David Brothers, whatever, a lot of us join because of revolutionary black nationalism, because at that time there's a thing called cultural nationalism, or what we call petty bourgeois pork chop nationalism. And those are the two strains within the movement, for the most part, that came post Nick, post the civil rights era. None of us was involved, a lot of us who were serious didn't want to get involved with this cultural bourgeois pork chop nationalism fronted off by us organization, or that network, that tendency was the East Coast with Haki or Barack or whatever, in Newark, we can go around the country. I joined because of revolutionary black nationalism. But all of a sudden, like the brother so eloquently said, you know, every year the ideology changed. You know, following year, 
Marxist-Leninism. Following year, Mao Zedong thought. Following year, Trotskyism. I remember going to the 1970 National Black Panther Party convention. At that convention, which got Howard University closes down, so we had to meet, you know, at uh, All Souls Church in a big rally in Malcolm X Park. It was told to us our new ideology is intercommunalism. There was this big, and none of us have been educated. What is intercommunalism? What is Trump? We didn't know. We didn't know. At the same time, there was this big coalition form with the gay community. And all of a sudden, in the middle of Malcolm X Park, you saw 500 gay folks marching in there for this alliance of the party. And all of us were shocked by this because we had never been educated about what is this all about. I had to go back in San Diego and report this. They people thought I was making this stuff up. I mean, I got alienated. And I basically said, no, I'm not giving up revolutionary nationalism. And I aligned myself with Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, David Brother, a whole series of folks. All of a sudden, I became the enemy because Stokely Carmichael was jacketed as CIA. So all my comrades, I thought I was the enemy because it's ideological confusion. So my criticism is that ideology must come from the masses, as the brother said correctly, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. That's why I encourage you in my earlier presentation to study traditional societies, because that's where ideology comes from, humanity. It doesn't come from all a person can do, whether it's Dewey or Karl Marx or Lenin, is observe, analyze from the people and develop theoretical construct that must go back to the people. The essence of democratic centralism is a democracy aspect. The central aspect always goes back to the masses. There's a bourgeois form, as there is with everything, of any theory or ideology, whether it's democratic centralism or socialism. We can look at democratic socialism. And there's a revolutionary aspect. So that's the negative. I can go in more detail, but I want to belabor the point. But critical, and I do believe in ideology because that's what holds us together. I remember the um, Gonzalez, Attorney General of the United States, when asked, what is the crisis in terms of the United States not being successful in Iraq? He said, it's ideological. The Iraqi people, the people of Afghanistan, the people of Somalia, have rejected U.S. ideology. And until the United States can sell the people of Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, Zimbabwe, American ideology, they will fight and resist to maintain their own indigenous ideology of their particular nation states. Ideology is what the battle is all about, the final analysis. Now, ideology is not just theory. It's theory and practice and historical evolution. The positive aspect, oh my gosh. Number one, within a one year period, I was arrested 38 times, beaten unconscious. I went through so much trauma at such a young age that now, no matter what comes at me, I ain't worried about it. I have no fear because I survived that. It's kind of like a saying in Trinidad, the rougher the waters, the stronger the swimmer. We were so brutalized, we were so challenged, and it didn't break my spirit that today, Challenging like with me and Mike with the crack the CIA coalition or with the riders every time I see them getting harassed by people I pull up my car and join with them. I have no fear of Zionists I have no fear because I had to face death at a very young age and to make a cold decision Am I gonna die for my beliefs? So it strengthened me and at 59 years old. I'm still full of fire still full of fight I don't want to pass a baton on to you all I want to hold the baton with you to burn out this motherfucker because we paid the dues to burn this sucker down We paid some dues um The other aspect of the party was the internationalism. The alliances that were made with the Puerto Rican comrades, the alliances that were made with the Chicano, the alliances made with the American Indian movement, the alliances were made with the Retreat movement in North Africa, the alliances made with the Algerian revolution, the alliances were made with, with the liberation movements throughout the world. The party taught me internationalism. Because sitting in San Diego, all I knew was black and white. We didn't have too many Latinos or Mexicans in those days. And the party taught me internationalism. And the third thing, and it's still alive today, is my comrades. My comrades, because you don't know, brothers here are still involved, sisters here are still involved with struggle, still involved with confronting the enemy. And it's kind of like a fraternity and sorority of us comrades. And we kind of just respect each other. I know that no matter what happens, my back is covered. And wherever I go, whether it's a, a UEP Newton funeral or, or a reunion meeting or whatever, there's a sense of comradeship because we made history. And most important, the history we made has been duplicated. It's a Black Panther Party of Israel with the Fulasha, the Ethiopian Jews that were brought into Israel who are facing racism. There's a Black Panther Party in India, the Dalit. The largest population of black folks in the world is in India. Y'all call them untouchables. They're dark Indians, black Indians, who because of the racist caste system of Hinduism are brutally oppressed 
with karma, generation after generation, they must maintain this lower caste. You can go to Sweden. You know, brothers and sisters in Sweden face racism, have taken the, 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 the spirit of the panther and applied it wherever they are on the run, South Africa. So the, so the legacy of the Black Panther Party, and I disagree to say the party is dead. The spirit still lives on, whether it's Malik Zulu Shabazz, the Black Riders, it's all over the world. So that though physically, the old original organization does not exist. The ideological, the spiritual, the militancy, that fire will exist a thousand years from now until we get the goddamn liberation. Because people understand the Black Panther Party represents revolution.